Good evening and welcome to the Truth Report at American Truth Project. I'm Barry Nussbaum. We have an incredibly special guest today. We have the Mr. Beat, Matt Beat, directly from the heartland of America. We're going to talk about his incredibly successful video on anti-Semitism that's been seen well over three million times around the world in the year it's been out. It is a extremely well done analysis on what it is and how prevalent it is, and it could not be a more important topic today. Mr. Beat, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, Barry. It's I'm glad to, to um, talk to you tonight. Yeah, uh, it's it's our pleasure and our honor to have you with us. So. Give us a little bit of a quick background on, on who Mr. Beat is and how you came to create a video that millions have seen. Well, I'm a teacher. I'm, I teach high school social studies, uh, and so I've taught for 10 years. I also have a journalism background and started my YouTube channel way back in 2011. I made this video uh, mostly a after teaching world history for a while and just noticing I mean, sure, hate goes around to all kinds of different groups, but why is it time and time again that uh, this one group is consistently targeted? So that, that's kind of always fascinated me, but I finally decided just to do, do some research and turn it into a video. Um, and so this has been my most successful video, I think mostly because it, it's kind of a, a clickbaity title. You know, I could have worded it differently, but I wanted to get people watching it. Unfortunately, it's, there's been a lot of people um, who are anti-Semitic who wa have watched the video. So uh, it has a lot of dislikes, a lot of really horrific comments. Um, some people criticize me for leaving those comments up, but on honestly, I, it's too much for me to, to sort through. <laughs> Last I checked, there was, uh, let's see, 88,169 comments. So uh, and also, it's kind of nice to have all these um, horrific comments in one place so that, you know, if there's ever any authorities that need to, like, kind of look up some <laughs> IP addresses, they know where to go. <laughs> so, I don't know. You're, you're, you're a troll farm for hate. <laughs> I am. It's, uh, and I, I, I pretty much tune out the negative comments, but there's been some positive comments as well. I've got some good reception for it. And I'm I'm not Jewish. Like uh, it's it's amazing how so many people just assume that I am because I'm you know defending a group of people who's consistently targeted. So uh, I think those are the most interesting comments. So like they just they talk about my appearance. They talk about uh, assumptions of you know where I'm from, stuff like that. So. Well, let's jump into it. And uh, like I said, I, I'm a great admirer of your work. Uh, it's a profoundly well done video that I encourage all of our viewers that will be watching this around the world to go check it out. Real quick, um, Mr. B, tell people where they can go watch what we're talking about. Oh, my channel is called uh, Mr. Beat. You just search on YouTube, you'll find it. If you just do the the URL is uh, youtube.com slash I am Mr. Beat. And, uh, or if you just search my name and uh, anti-Semitism, this will pop, the video will pop up. Thank you for saying such nice things about my video, by the way. <laughs> it's well, it, it, it is that well done and, it, and quality and uh, insight deserves to be recognized. So let's jump into it. Um, Matt, what is it if you were to take away a couple of answers to the following question, what would your educated response be? Why is America experiencing so much anti-Semitism? And then we'll go to the rest of the world. So what are your what what are a couple of takeaways from that? Well, I think there's two takeaways that I've noticed about anti-Semitism today. Uh, the first being momentum. I mean, uh, it really started with the exiles of um, the Jewish people and, and uh, their homeland. And, and, you know, this is before the time of Jesus. This is hundreds of years before when they were consistently exiled time and time again. And then it carried over after Jesus, with the earliest Christians um, 
you know, them classifying people based on their religion. And uh, so when people think of this in a vacuum, it's ridiculous. I mean, that's why I try to go back with the history in my video as much as I could. But honestly, I didn't go back far enough. And that's one thing I, I could have done be better. Um, however, when I the second part of anti-Semitism today, I think is probably more relevant. Um, and I think it's usually uh, it revolves around Israel. It starts with Israel and whatever Israel is doing, uh, people at first, they, they will criticize um, the Israeli government. Uh, and, you know, it's okay to criticize governments, of course, especially when they're doing things that are, are hurting people. But then over time, uh, people become more radicalized and they start to target all Jewish people. So it starts off like with legitimate criticism of of a government, um, and then it just morphs over time. And then, uh, of course, it's not just Middle Eastern countries where you see this, because with the internet these days, it's just anybody can access this stuff anywhere. So that's why I think well, it spreads so much. Let's let's localize to the United States. Let's start there because I think it's a different cause, although there may be some relation. Um, what I see, is especially. Um, in the last, say, half dozen years as an explosion of intolerance by what is now called the progressive left within America. Um, if you are different in any way, you're probably the reason why that person is upset. And there's a long list of grievances, especially on college campuses, uh, that people have and in many cases, they have the reason why. Um, with the election of Donald Trump several years ago, uh, Trump became the why for almost every problem in America, uh, whether it was anti-Semitism, in other words, the president is anti-Semitic and encouraging that behavior. It was racist behavior because he was racist. It was anti Hispanic because he hates Latinos, it's anti-female because he's misogynist, and so on. When in reality, in, in a factual interpretation, you've never had a president of the United States with a Jewish daughter, a Jewish son-in-law, and Jewish grandchildren until Donald Trump. And not just Jewish, but observant Orthodox Jews who literally work with him in the White House every day. Um, in addition, you've never had a president that's done more for the state of Israel than Trump. So people that call him out as being anti-Semitic might as well be calling him a, you know, a three-headed lizard. It has about as little semblance of fact to it. And yet anti-Semitism is exploding, at, at least among the progressive left. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not, because I in my video, I. Uh, I have a little clip from Vice where they it's the uh, the the white nationalists that are anti-Semitic and uh, which they're they're not happy with President Trump because of um, you know family members who are Jewish um, but uh, and almost they're, like they're in denial but I think it's interesting there are like you said there are elements of that on the left as well and this is one area where the horseshoe theory I think is true where you have kind of extremes on both sides that come extremes on both sides come together uh, to share with their hate. <laughs> um, on the left, I think it, I'm not sure if I know too much about this because I, I haven't researched this too much, but from what I've seen, a lot of it is, like, like what, what I said earlier, it's rooted in anti-Zionism and then it kind of radicalizes from there. So, um, but on the right, I think it's more of a place of, it starts, it's probably more related to ethnic, uh, you know, the uh, the white nationalist kind of strain, I guess. Well, let's, let's talk about the progressive left for a minute. Um, there is a profound um, anti-American sentiment. In other words, the American system of capitalism is bad. The American system of wealth creation is bad. The American foreign policy of protecting certain allies around the world is bad. The American immigration system that doesn't open the borders to everybody is bad. And so there's a complete, uh, what would you say, maybe a rejection of what has made this country what it is, 
and everything is different in the minds of the progressive left in order to save the country. And ironically, and, and I'm sure you've seen this, and maybe you teach it in the classroom, when you ask kids, what do you like about socialism? Other than they get more things, they readily don't know and they can't explain it. And the ones that would classify themselves as communists and, and point to communist successes around the world are so tragically misinformed by your fellow teachers uh, Mr. Beat, it's very discouraging that they're not learning in the classroom what communism really is. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's funny you say that. I actually have another video I made about the difference between capitalism, socialism, and communism, and uh, that's also been a pretty successful video. And I, I think those terms get thrown around all the time, and they and they have different meanings, and so people don't even know what they mean when they say socialism or <laughs> communism. Like I think a lot of times we should just all realize that we're against authoritarianism. Like, uh, cause when, ultimately that's what the Soviet union was. It was just authoritarianism. It was totalitarianism. And I think hopefully most of us agree that's a bad thing. We don't want that kind of thing to happen again. And so I also teach economics. And so, uh, I, I don't even use those terms very often because they're so uh, the meanings of they kind of lost meaning, especially the word socialism. It's either something that some people embrace or other people say it's the most evil thing ever. And so I basically say, hey, we have a mixed economic system where sometimes the government steps in, sometimes or other times it doesn't. And I so think what, that's what actually you, more accurate. What, and I agree. And what, when you add the idea of why you aren't successful and why you don't have what you want, it's quite easy to pick a minority that historically has been the reason why. In other words, mm. Jews have been scapegoats, as you said, for three millennia, since before the time of Jesus in, in ancient Israel. If there was just one group of people that has been kind of consistently persecuted throughout world history, what's the first group that comes to mind to you? The Jewish population. The Jewish people. Uh, the first group I probably think of with that would be um, the Jewish people. Almost every single one of my colleagues said the same thing. They said the same group was the one that first came to mind when they thought about groups that were targeted throughout world history. Um, small group, easily identified, not assimilated, uh, quite easy to pin all the world's woes on it. And, I, and there's something else I think we should add. Um, in regards to the new progressive movements within this country, it has sprung up largely and almost uh, exclusively in the beginning on college campuses where hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions of Middle Eastern oil money has been invested in departments who have created an educational system based on the fact that Zionism is bad, that Islam is good, and what has been largely, if not completely, whitewashed is that Islam, unlike Christianity that has largely reformed over the last thousand years, as you and I know, Islam has the death penalty associated with anyone who wants to change the word of the prophet. So if Muhammad says, find the Jew and kill him, the Jew is your enemy, make him your slave, take his women as your sex slaves, kill the men or sell them as slaves. Anyone that doesn't follow that and suggest a change is an apostate and subject to the death penalty. So university after university with Islamic studies departments that are teaching this are literally infesting the education uh, of America's youth who then become America's young and then mature adults with the concept that the people that live here that help build this country are somehow the enemy of God. And I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, you, you make a good point about the, um, how Islam has struggled to modernize, whereas Judaism and Christianity, they've, they've modernized, they've um, become, and they don't take the old text literally. And I found it interesting, some of the comments in my video uh, kept mentioning that, just read the Talmud, uh, like, just read it. And I'm like, okay, but like, 
you realize we don't have to take these ancient texts literally anymore, right? Like, because like, if you read the Old Testament, the Christian, like, oh my gosh, there's some horrible things in there, like how to treat your slaves and stuff like that. So um, that's pretty revealing if, if you're, uh, you're focusing so much on ancient, ancient texts that you're like, that's what's driving your hate. Yeah, it's really important. You make a very, very um, important comment there, Mr. B, which is the difference between the ancient texts and the sociology or maybe the political science of that application today. In other words, there's no country in the world that is Christian in its orientation that believes uh, you kill someone for adultery, or you cut off their hand for thievery, or you can buy or sell slaves, or you can beat your children and your women to death. Um, you can kill someone for leaving Christianity. Judaism has no application of any rules like that. Islam, that's today's Islam. If, if you are a Muslim, you self-identify as a Muslim, and you give up your faith publicly, you're subject to the death penalty. I mean that literally. If you are a man and have three or four wives and you don't like the way they're acting, hey, go beat them up. There's specific instructions and there's videos on YouTube on how to beat your wife or how to beat your children. Um, female genital mutilation would not be tolerated in a Christian or a Jewish or a Buddhist or an agnostic society, but among Muslims, it's to be expected. You mutilate your Muslim daughters so they don't enjoy sex. So there's been a change in the world, whether it's reformation or modernization or just evolution. The other religions have changed and Islam hasn't. And so if Islam is teaching within our culture, you're gonna get a difference of opinion. And eventually what has happened just a few months ago, with the election of very outspoken, prominent Muslims to Congress who are preaching the beauty of Islam, literally lying to the American public, it becomes, well, kind of mainstream. And their anti-Semitism gets a lot of press. Why would you say, Matt, that it hasn't been condemned in the press other than by, say, opposition party members? you have a thought on that? I, I I can't really, I don't know enough about that. I will say that it's probably not the best to broad too much of a, paint too broad of a brush because there are two and a half billion Muslims in the world. And uh, when we talk about Saudi Arabia, uh, Muslims there, and we compare them to, uh, to Muslims in say uh, Indonesia, you're gonna get quite a difference. And, and so I, there are secular Muslims. Um, I think when we talk about extremists um, who are fundamentalists, meaning they take these texts literally. I think it's important to say, it's not as it's not all doom and gloom. It's, this is, I think, a fairly small group of people. There are a lot of peaceful Muslims that are actually fairly secular. They don't take all this old stuff seriously. Um, as far as what's going on in the United States, though, I, I can't really, I guess I don't know much about that. So like, I can't really comment too much on that, but. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the biggest funder of American universities with foreign money. And their brand of Islam is called Wahhabism. Yeah. Uh, they are very extreme. Uh, and they are, as you pointed out, literal in their interpretation of Sharia, which are uh, yeah. the books of Islam. Um, the vast majority of Muslims in the world aren't strict. Um, interpreters word for word, but with two or three billion, and the number that's usually batted around is eight to 10% are strict in their interpretation. That's a lot of people. Yeah, and, I've, I've seen figures like that too. And that's, that's a little scary. Um, but even like, I have another video, sorry to keep plugging my videos. That's fine, go for it. <laughs> I have another video comparing Saudi Arabia and Iran. And what I was, I've always been fascinated, but because, you know, Iran is seen as this evil country, you know, like uh, George W. Bush said that they were um, after I Iraq and North Korea, they were like the other evil country. But actually the younger people there are not quite as radicalized. They're not fundamentalist uh, Muslims. And I, I think that's promising too, is that 
even in a country uh, like Iran, you're seeing a lot of them reject these old, like, because, you know, it wasn't that long ago. It was uh, the revolution that happened there in the late 70s uh, that tried to bring a return to a more conservative, uh, fundamentalist-based um, theocracy, which they still have a theocracy. Um, but, yeah, like, I think that's really, I, I try to, I guess, see the the more positive, like, that these uh, these groups are, because when I hear eight to ten percent, I, I am skeptical. I've, but I've heard that from several places, and so uh, if that is true, that is scary. That is scary. Well, I'll tell you. You mentioned Iran, which I happen to know uh, quite a bit about, and it's important to differentiate between the Persian people, as it were, and the government of Iran. Um, most of the Iranians that are young and they have an enormous population under the age of 30 does not want the theocracy anymore does not want the the uh strict interpretation they don't want the women in hijab and to be covered and, and to be beaten they want equality of the sexes they want to go back to the way it was before they were born unfortunately the government that's in control of the money and the army and the missiles and the nuclear program every single day runs pictures and uh, videos on their mass media calling for the death to America and the death to Israel. And they mean it. And as long as they're in power, if it's two weeks or 200 years, Mr. B, that's who we have to deal with. You know, like Netanyahu says all the time, we don't have a problem with the people of Iran. We have a problem with the government of Iran that says they're going to kill all of us. And that's an issue, right? And that Definitely. issue is not anti-Israel. It's anti-Semitic. In other words, they're not being just critical of, well, Likud won and, and we wanted merits or the blue and white party because we have a different political opinion. No, they, they want all the Jews in one place so they can all be killed easily with several nuclear weapons. And they've said that very prominently in the press for years and years and years. And like you said earlier, that's not anti-Israel. That's anti-Jewish. And anti-Jewish means anti-Semitism. And that's what we're talking about rather than the political end of it. How, how much would you ascribe to a religious background of the anti-Semitism? You talked about it quite a bit in your video, which I thought was a terrific history lesson uh, about the church from the very early days of the church in the third and fourth century, coming up with laws making Jews not citizens, can't own property, can't vote, uh, can't testify in court, um, basically disenfranchising them as equal members of whatever society they were talking about. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, over a period of hundreds of years, but I think uh, one of the examples that I think is telling is how because they couldn't own property or because uh, they were shut out of society so much, uh, one of the only things they could do to make a living was money lending. And so uh, this is that stere that old stereotype of uh, the Jewish money lender it has roots in anti-Semitism. <laughs> that was like, that was the only way they could accumulate wealth. Um, and I think as far as uh, the Martin Luther thing really disturbed me. Like I never had realized how anti-Semitic he was. Um, and I mean, just his own words, like, you know, the, on the Jews and their lies, that pamphlet, it's just, holy crap. And this is the guy who's uh, the hero that led the Protestant Reformation. And uh, as you know, that's the majority of Americans are Protestants. They're, uh, it's, they're not Catholic. I'll look at, there's still 20 some percent Catholics in the United States and most of my family's Catholic actually. Um, but usually these, the early antisemitism, uh, that you saw like up until the mid middle ages was the Catholic church kind of, uh, gets associated with that. And I, I mean, I, one response to my video was that it was just a few bad actors, like a few bad popes or bishops or whatever. And I agree with that. I mean, it wasn't systematic. It wasn't everybody in the church. But the fact is, because of the fact that there was no separation of government and, and the Catholic Church in, in many parts of Europe and uh, the, like the Middle Ages and before, um, 
that that just happened. I mean, yeah, they went hand in hand. Anytime there was, if you discriminated against Jews because they weren't going to mass every Sunday, then also you're discriminating them with laws so that they went hand in hand. And that just carried over. Like I said earlier, that momentum carried all the way up into the present day. Um, oh, absolutely. And you know, the irony is I, I see these proclamations all the time, especially coming out of Europe. And as, as well, unbelievable lies uh, from certain prominent members of, um, of American society, either in Congress or like we talked about a guy like Farrakhan, who can say such outrageous things that, you know, Israel's an apartheid state, uh, Muslims have no voice and their babies are sterilized or they're uh, sacrificed to drain their blood for Passover. I mean, just outrageous lie after outrageous lie. And yet those people are no longer censored for it. They still have their Twitter accounts. They're still up on Facebook. Their videos are on YouTube. And as you've said, their comments are almost unbelievable in what they're saying. And I can tell you as someone who's been to Israel many times, if there's only one country within a thousand miles where everybody gets to vote, where there is true equality among religions, where there's true equality among the sexes, where there's true equality in employment, in voting, in politics, in all of society, and that's Israel. There are no Jews in government in any country around Israel, and yet there's a Muslim on the Supreme Court in Israel. Yeah, there's a lot of Muslims uh, who live peacefully uh, within Israel. That's something that uh, I I've learned too fairly recently. Um, I have a you know I I have a pretty balanced perspective on um, the Arab-Israeli conflict. I mean, it's uh, I took a class uh, in college where my teacher was Israeli. Uh, it was a, the class was called Arab-Israeli conflict, and we looked at the whole history. And then his best friend was Palestinian and he came in and taught a few courses and they taught together, it was beautiful. But uh, I also have a friend whose dad was a refugee from Palestine, a Palestinian refugee, and then he ended up in the United States after spending many years in Jordan. And um, so I get it, like, we, I think you and I both agree that, um, that Israel has made, their government has made mistakes. But I think the net positive as far as, far as bringing uh, this modern democracy uh, to an area that doesn't have much of it. You can't deny that. I mean, uh, it's, I wish that it would spread. I mean, we, <laughs> I, again, Saudi Arabia, not too far away. And it's pretty, it's disturbing to me that they're such a big ally with the United States. And yet they are a lot of what the way they run, like, you know, women couldn't even drive in Saudi Arabia until just this past year. Like, yeah, holy if, crap. You, if you, if you as a Catholic, whether you're practicing or not, but you, you would, you would self-identify probably culturally as Catholic. If you went to any of those countries, I mean this literally, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Libya, Morocco, any of those places, God forbid Iran, and started saying, hey, how come the priests can't conduct mass anymore? How come Catholics are being systematically excluded from government, from property rights, from ability to assemble, uh, the ability to communicate with other Catholics? In a very short order, the secret police would visit you. The religious police would visit you. You would end up in prison or deported on the low end. In other words, if you hadn't been a very prominent organizer, they would kick you out. And if you were prominent, your body would never be found. And I mean that literally. And it's very common for anyone preaching religious equality or equality of the sexes, or God forbid you wanted gay rights, you would end up dead. I've been to the Gaza border and seen the building that Hamas throws the gays off of. And it's a three-story building. And the reason they do that is they don't want them to die easily. They want them to suffer horribly. And a big crowd gathers, and they do that as a demonstration 
as to how evil it is to violate the word of God, which means they will kill you slowly so you set an example so other people don't think they should consider a gay lifestyle. It's, it's horrible, and if you haven't seen it, it's hard to believe. It is hard to believe. I have not, I have not heard about that. That's crazy. Well, I mean, look, in, I, I'm trying to remember which country it was uh, in the Middle East. I don't want to quote it because I don't want to be wrong, but in one of those countries, the leader just announced, we don't have any gays in our country. Because oh, I think it was Iran, I believe, if I remember correctly. It, it very well could be because it's also such a... atheist. They don't have any atheists in their country. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. They just don't come out because they know they'll be in trouble. Well, it's not just, it's not trouble like you pay a fine. It's trouble like... Uh, Prison. You're, you're tortured and, and your legs are broken and you're whipped. And, and if you survive, you're a lucky guy or lady. Um, it, it's, it's horrific what the punishments are if you're outside the, the, the coloring book lines. Sorry, I just, we have one big final point I'd like to make is that I think, uh, you know, all these hate, hateful comments um, all, and there are a lot of anti-Semitic comments in my, under my video, and it is disheartening. But I think uh, it's important to remember that these are just human beings, and they were taught to hate. They were taught by somebody else. And if we want to break the cycle, I think we need to communicate with these people. Um, we need to make, it's kind of like, this, I say the same thing about flat earthers. <laughs> it's like, if you show, like, you at least are trying to respect them and and listen to them. Now, the people that say hateful things, it's, I mean, I understand like why you would not ever want to talk to them, but I'm an outsider. I'm not somebody who's personally being attacked for being Jewish. I'm being attacked for making a video. And so I, I think, oh, like if you communicate with them, if, if you make them, because if you censor them too, I could just turn, I could just take off all the comments. That's going to empower them because then they're going to like feel like they're going to dig in their heels deeper. They're going to be, see, they're censoring us. And so Jews really do control the world, yada, yada. And like, so I think that'd be one of the worst things you can do is like censor them and like, let them be heard, let their hate be heard to the world. Um, and hopefully over time, they'll realize on their own, like look around and like, maybe this is wrong what we're doing. Maybe I overreacted. Maybe I was taught this by my dad or my brother or who else. Like, uh, so I feel like, uh, the way to go about it is education, and that's what I try to do. Um, All right, so if you, had, if you had an audience now, the same three or four million people that saw your anti-Semitism video, but let's just say now, Mr. B, it's, these are people that are the haters that are posting all that stuff underneath your video, that you're a puppet of the Zionist world government and all that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> obviously, Mr. Puppet, what, what would you say to them to communicate with them that their belief system is, is based on ancient prejudices that have no place in a modern world? I would say uh, just talk to somebody who's Jewish and, and uh, like I have Jewish friends and they're, they're not secretly running the world, I swear. They, like, uh, they're just normal people. They, uh, I think, man, I, I just want to understand, you know, like try to understand more about where this hatred is coming from and keep asking them questions really. Cause like, I think that's what drive, what drove me to make the video, make the video in the first place is just, uh, I was not raised this way. Um, and understanding why they were raised this way but we've got to break the cycle. It, the cycle continues. And I think uh, the same thing with the Arab Israeli, Israeli conflict. I mean, we've got to communicate. If we just st stay in our bubbles, you know, um, then it's not going to help anything. Both sides have to come together and at least communicate, you know. I would add, and I agree with everything you said. I love your idea. I would add one more thing, and that is from a historical perspective, each time there has been a targeting of Jews, whether it was 
2,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, or the Weimar Republic, you know, in Germany. Mm -hmm. It was because there was a problem and the government or whoever was in charge, whether it was the church uh, or the mosque or the central government, it's easier to give people a reason why they're not doing well outside of themselves and outside of the government because you can point over there, that's why you don't have a job. That's why your student loan costs so much. That's why your housing sucks. That's why your car breaks. That's why you can't get ahead. It's easy to target a group that's identifiable, not very large, and might look different, talk different, sound different, worship different, and so on. It's much easier to stay in power. The Russians did it, Soviet Union. The Germans did it. The Iranians are doing it. And now the progressive left, at the same time as the right-wing white supremacists are doing it, as you called it a horseshoe, I thought that was a really insightful comment. The hatred from the left meets the hatred on the right. And the reason why they don't have what they want is because of a group over there that they can identify instead of taking responsibility for their own lives and their own situation and saying, hey, I'm going to be better. I'm going to get educated. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to reach out and figure out how we can do this together and make the world a better place. It's easier to say, not my fault. It's your fault. Yeah, that's, I would agree. Yeah, so economic opportunity is going to have to be, getting rid of poverty is going to really help more than anything. Let's be honest here. Like, yeah, because like you said, if somebody's struggling to, like, you know, medical bills, college, student loans are out of inflation, wages are stagnant, wages have been stagnant my entire life. So, okay, let's just blame that group of people for that. Like, if, um, if these people didn't have some, something to complain about, then they wouldn't have someone to blame. <laughs> and often it's funny, like instead of blaming governments, the ones who have the power, we look to the side and blame other groups of people. Isn't that amazing? It's always people that are like the yeah. other. What, what's the term? Yeah. We blame the other. Right? Capital O. And it's usually a group that doesn't have power. Like, like why would you, it's a minority group that doesn't have much political power. And it's because they're an easy target oftentimes. So, Matt, it's been great having you today. Tell our viewers where they can find you and where they can go to see your stuff and support you. Uh, yeah, just look me up uh, on YouTube. It's just Mr. Beat. And thanks for having me on and saying nice things about my video. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely do it again. I want to thank our viewers today uh, who subscribe to American Truth Project. And obviously, I'd encourage anybody to go to our website, americantruthproject.org, or the easier way to find it, findberry.com takes you to our website. Sign up for free. You can watch more of Mr. Beat and uh, other very wise and insightful guests by going to that site, signing up, and we'll send you for free. It never costs anything. Again, thanks for joining us today, Mr. Beat, and thank you to our wonderful viewers. I'm Barry Nussbaum, and this is The Truth Report.